two cherubims over top and the covenant upon it. Yeah. Visualize that. It is a real place, a heavenly real place, more real than this place. Yeah. Come on. And he says, thou shalt put the mercy seat. Mercy seat. He instructed Moses about the mercy seat. Mercy seat. That word is only used in this context. And it means a cover for the sacred ark. A cover for the sacred ark. It comes from the word to put an end to. To cancel. Cancel. So the mercy seat is above the law. The law is in the box. The mercy seat is on top. Mercy seat means to cover, to end and extinguish the guilt. That's what the word means, to end and extinguish the guilt. And then he says, and there I will meet you. He says that. He said that to Moses. And there, where? At the mercy seat. And there I will meet you. That word meet there means to summon to trial. And there I will summon to trial. There I will summon to trial. To direct you in a certain position. I will summon to trial. And then he says, and I will commune, you, commune with you. I will speak to you. I will declare to you. I will promise and pronounce to you. Now that was in the day of Moses. And the priest had to enter into the tabernacle and he had to put blood on the mercy seat. Because without the blood, judgment would have fallen upon the priest that came in. Not only that, but it would have fallen on the people the priest was representing. But Hebrews tells us that Jesus entered once for all with his own blood in the heavenlies and put his own blood on that mercy seat. His own blood is on that mercy seat as a valuable witness, as valuable evidence. Do we have that slide? Evidence, the head slide, valuable evidence. His own blood is valuable evidence on that mercy seat that everything you've ever done or ever will do has been paid for. Valuable evidence. His blood, valuable evidence that it's paid for. It's a done deal. And then in Hebrews chapter 4, it says, come boldly to the throne of grace. It means come boldly to the stately seat. The throne of grace. Again, a legal term. When you enter a courtroom, remember, this is review from last week. When you enter a co courtroom, one of the first things they say is counsel for defense present. If you've ever been on trial or ever called as a witness, the judge says, is counsel for defense present? And we can all say, because of the blood of Jesus, yes, it is. That my counsel for my defense is presence. And last week I told us we have a legal team. We have a legal team. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And we looked at the word plead. Plead. How do you plead? Don't they say that when you enter in? Are you guilty? Are you innocent? How do you plead? How do you plead? That's what they say. And that's a Bible term. Jesus, the Lord says, come, plead, let us plead together. Let us plead together. In our mind, we think that's arguing back and forth, that I got to plead with God. No, 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 no. It says, let us plead together, meaning he's saying, I'm on your case. I'm your attorney. I'll tell you what to say. I'm your attorney. We go together. We go together. Let us plead together. Unity. Right? Let us plead together. This is just a brief review. But he argues our case on behalf of who? On behalf of what? The blood of Jesus on the mercy seat. Well, why is that necessary? Because we have an we have an adver we have a adversary. We have an adversary. We have an enemy. 
And Revelation tells us that our enemy is the accuser of the brethren. So he's up there going in front of God. Oh, did you see what he did? Oh, did you see what she did? Oh, 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 what about this? What about this? What about this? Well, the blood is there. Jesus is there. And he's already saying, that's covered. That's covered. That's covered. That's covered. That's covered. That's covered. And so when the gavel goes down, it's innocent. 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 Why? Because the blood of Jesus paid the price. You don't have to be shipped on down the river, so to speak. Right? You don't have to serve your time locked behind bars. You don't have to serve your time in bondage to anything. Pastor and I were talking yesterday about how people, it seems like almost people take a, a mentality, an attitude that when something bad happens to them or a sickness comes on their body, right away they think, well, that's just my punishment. No, 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 no. Punishment's been paid. Punishment's been paid. Blood of Jesus applied. Blood of Jesus has been applied. All has been paid. All has been paid. So when sickness does come on your body, it's trespassing. Yes. Trespassing. It's breaking the law. What law? God's law. God's law that supersedes all law. The court of the supreme. You see? Is this, is this resonating with you? You don't have to serve any penance. You don't have to serve any time. You don't have to pay for it. It's already paid for. You didn't pray this morning. <sniffs> Too bad. I don't mean that disrespectfully. We should pray every day because he'll tell us what to say. He's our defense attorney. He is the counsel for defense. So he tells us what to say in that situation. How do you plead? How do you plead? That's what we need to know. How do you plead? When the court of creation says, how do you plead? Do you know how to plead? Do you know you're innocent? Do you know it's been paid for? Everything? That's why people say, I plead the blood. Because the blood paid the price. I plead the blood. It's not just a happy religious saying or a happy religious dance or a happy Christian dance. It's not that I plead the blood. It is not that. It is a legal binding term in the courts of heaven. It's nothing to play with. Oh, just plead the blood. It is nothing to play with. It is a serious state of being, and it will set you free. It will and has, but you have to appropriate it, you see. You have to take part in it. You have to. You have to. Pastor mentioned last week, and I'm not going to tiptoe on that too much other than to say pastor mentioned last week if you're called into a court of law and they say is counsel for defense present he stands up she stands up said yes your honor i am here and then he says to the defendant how do you plead that defendant has already talked to his counsel of defense and he already knows what he's going to say and he stands up and says, not guilty, your honor. The enemy comes and tries to accuse you of things. And you are in front of the great judge. And he says, how do you plead? And you look to Holy Ghost. How do I plead? I feel guilty here, Lord. I did it. I did it. I did that thing. I feel guilty. I feel like this is my punishment. Holy Ghost says, paid for. Blood of Jesus is on the mercy suit. You're innocent. You're innocent. Plead the blood. Plead the blood. Plead the blood. Shh. But pastor brought out, if that defendant sitting there 
the attorney stood up and said, counsel is present. And the defendant stands up and the judge says, how do you plead? And he keeps his mouth shut. Then the judge says, contempt of court. And yet we're no different. We're no different in the great hall of God's courts. Because he'll say, how do we plead? And we sit there with our mouth shut. Or wallow in what the enemy's been telling. Well, I guess I'm guilty because look at this thing that happened to me and I didn't get healed, so I guess I've been bad or I guess I missed it or I guess, I guess, I guess, I guess, I guess, I guess, I guess. When all along, all we have to do is confer with our counsel, our counsel team, our legal team. That's all we have to do. Confer with our counsel. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Who's the Son? The Word of God. That's all we have to do is, is confer with him. Let us plead together, he says. Let us plead together. I have one more verse. I'm just looking for it, and then I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Steve. I know it's right here. Oh. One of the terms that I didn't mention last week was witness. That's another legal term, full of, chock full in the Bible. Witness, Right? Witness. Hebrews 10.28 says, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy. He that despised Moses' law. He's talking about the Israelites. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Two or three witnesses. See, they weren't, they weren't stoned until two or three witnesses said they did it. A lot, of, a, a lot of sin in the Bible, breaking of the law, was punishable by death. And mostly, it was by stoning. So, you understand then, the woman caught in adultery? The woman caught in adultery. She's caught in adultery. They drag her out. They throw her at Jesus' feet. There's a circle of men around her. And they're saying, this woman's caught in adultery. They're, they're looking to have the right to stone her because under Moses' law, they had a right to stone her. It was legal. At any moment, they could have picked up the stones and threw them at her until she died. But Jesus, you see, James tells us that mercy overtakes judgment. Mercy overtakes judgment. So Jesus, full of grace and truth and mercy, he says to her woman, or he says to the, to the men, let him among you who is without sin cast the first stone. One by one, you can hear the stones drop into the ground. Boom, they leave. Boom, they leave. Boom. Boom. One by one, pretty soon there's no one standing around her holding a rock. And he says to her, Women, woman, where are your accusers? She looks around. None, Lord. And he said, Neither do I accuse you. Neither do I. Why? Because he knew he was paying for her sin. He knew he was paying for her sin. His blood would be shed for her sin. So he was looking for the witnesses. Let him among you cast the first stone. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So when something comes against you, accusing you, you get some witnesses. You go to the word of God, and you get your witnesses out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. You go through the word, and you find the witness of the blood of Jesus being paid for you on your behalf, and then you confer with the Holy Ghost, and then he will tell you what to say. Pastor. Hallelujah. Come boldly. That's why we can come boldly. That's why when it says come boldly to the throne of grace, that's why we can come boldly. Even if you don't feel worthy, even if you are keeping a record of your faults, 
you can come boldly because he's not keeping a record of your faults. Because when he looks at the mercy seat, what does he see? The blood of Jesus. Every time you call on the blood of Jesus, you are at the mercy seat. Literally. Every time you call on the blood of Jesus, you are at the mercy seat. Who's at the mercy seat? God, our Father, Every time you call on the blood of Jesus, you are at the mercy seat in his presence. Every time. Every time. Come boldly. That's where I'll meet with you. Now, it says that's where where I'll summon you to trial, but it doesn't say summon you to trial. It says that's where I'll meet with you. That's where I will summon to trial. You're not on trial. See, the devil wants you to think you are. Because he's the accuser of the brethren. But you've, it's already been paid for. Your faith is on trial. Not you. Peter says that. Your faith is on trial. First Peter. I'll read that and then we'll turn it over. First Peter 7. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried by fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Your faith is on trial. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory Thank you, to God. Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, as we were both preparing for this. Thinking of the terms, the legal terms. It's just important to understand that the first place the enemy is going to try to come at us, whenever there's a, the, he's the accuser of the brethren we just heard, whenever the accusers come and you, you have to give your confession. You have to give your confession. When, when the police bring someone in for questioning, they're looking for a confession. They're looking for a confession. And that confession will help them determine many times whether or not you're guilty or whether or not you're innocent. See, and that's what the enemy wants to do. The enemy's looking for your confession. What are you going to confess? What are you confessing to? Mm -hmm. See, if you're speaking the word of God, you're confessing to the promises. But if you speak contrary to the word of God, you're confessing to the issue. You're confessing to the law that was broken. Well, you didn't break any laws because Jesus fulfilled the law. I said, you didn't break any laws. Jesus fulfilled the law. Turn with me, if you would, over to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to look at a few scriptures here that talk about our confession or our profession. Same word in the Bible. Same word. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14 in the King James. Sometimes you just got to go to the King James, and I know a lot of times people don't like to look at it with all of these and the thous, but sometimes the King James is the only thing that says it exactly the way it needs to be said. Glory to God. Thank God for all the other translations. They bring light. They shed light in areas sometimes in our everyday vernacular, so don't, don't discard other translations. Amen? Heard one preacher say, well, if King James was good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. (laughs) How many know that King James wasn't around when Paul was around? (laughs) But seriously, don't discard other translations. There are other translations and paraphrases that bring light and illumination. But it's still the King James Version is still the most accurate, they say. And you'll find some of the most truth out of it. But sometimes, if you're like me, I don't speak, speak King James Elizabethan. And sometimes the these and the thous and everything, it's just like, what are you saying? So I turn to other, and it brings light. And then I can go back to the King James and go, now I get it. I see what they're saying here. But in the King James, Ephesians chapter, or Hebrews, I'm sorry, chapter 4, 
in verse 14, it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest. Who's our great high priest? Jesus. Jesus. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Or you could say, let us hold fast to our confession. Confession of what? Confession of him being Lord. That's first and foremost, you hold fast to the fact that, he's confession, that, that your confession is he's Lord. He's Lord over every situation and circumstance that comes in your life. Sickness comes on your body, you hold fast to your profession. He's Lord over my life. Sickness, you have to go. Sickness, you're not mine. See, the one thing we've got to understand, I shared this a little bit, I just kind of alluded to it last week. One of two things is lying. If God's word says that we are or you were healed, 1 Peter 2, 24 says, by his stripes, you were healed. Well, what is the word were? It's past tense. We've got to understand, it's past tense, which means you were healed the day that Jesus hung on the cross and took the penalty. Every sickness, every disease, every infirmity was placed upon his body. Right. Which means if it was placed on his body, that means it's not placed on your body. You might say, well, you don't understand. I feel this way. Well, what's lying? Is the disease or is the, the, the symptom of the disease the lying thing? Or is God's word the lying thing? So that's the only choice you've got there. You've really got to narrow it down to the simplest of things. What's lying? See, when we hold fast to our profession, we're holding fast to the truth of God's word. God says he'd never lie. So if he says you're healed, you're healed. You say, yeah, but you don't understand. I went to the doctor and the doctor said this and the doctor said that. Well, who's, whose word are you going to believe? Does the doctor hold final authority in your life or does God's word hold final authority in your life? See, the things of this world, the words of this world, the words of the doctors, the words of the banking institutions, the words of this world are all natural words. But the word of God is a supernatural thing. Yeah, See, we've got to make sure that we understand that in our mind. The word of God is something that is supernatural. Supernatural law supersedes natural law. Come on. I've been thinking a lot about that lately. Yeah. Yeah. Because... Many times, and I've done this before, and the Lord says, and I just when you preach this, if you ever preach it again, be careful how you say it. Be careful how you teach it. But I, many of you have probably heard, you know, well, there's certain things that just can't be changed. You know, God's placed laws within the land. Well, and, and preachers love to use the law of gravity. Well, you know, there's the law of gravity. If you step off a building, you know, but boom, splat. You're going to go, well, that is true. There is a law. But you have to understand, gravity is a natural law. It is not a spiritual law. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, think about when Peter was in the boat. The disciples were in the boat, and Jesus, when he, Peter looked out to Jesus, and he says, if that's you, bid me to come. Jesus said, well, it's me, come. Well, that one word, that confession or that profession, that one word that said come, held power to supersede natural law. Because if gravity was a, was a supernatural law, the minute Peter stepped out, he'd have sank immediately, but he didn't. Why? Because there was a supernatural law that superseded natural law. Yes. The word of God is a supernatural thing. It will yes. supersede natural law. Yes. yes. Which means if the doctor said, you're going to die, the word of God supernaturally can reverse that situation. Yes. Yes. That's why Peter was able to walk on water. God's, Jesus' word, one word, he spoke one word. There was enough power in that one word. Jesus said, come. And the power in that word superseded natural law, the law of gravity. Because Peter stepped out on the water and he didn't go to the bottom. That's correct. But now when he got to looking at the circumstances, we understand, he started to go to the bottom. The natural law started to go back into effect. For a moment in Peter's time, the supernatural law of the confessed word or the spoken word that Jesus spoke superseded the natural law, and Peter was able to walk out. But the minute he got looking at the circumstance, see, and that's what the accuser comes. The accuser comes, he'll call you in, and he'll sit down, and what's your confession? Now, to the, last night I was looking at, the Lord just put on my heart about a coerced confession. And I start looking at coerced confession. And I start looking at confession that's given under duress. 
Well, when I started looking at it uh, through the ages, what they used to do is they would continue to put pressure on the one they were looking for a confession from. And they put so much pressure on them, so much pressure on them, they would actually get someone to confess of a crime they didn't do. Well, how many know that if you've ever been facing something that seems insurmountable and difficult, the enemy will continue to bombard you and come at you. He's like, there's no way out of this. There's no way out of this. You're going to fail. You're going to fail. You are a failure. Yeah, 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 that sickness, that you're all over with now. Yeah, 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 that, that, that cancer, it's got you now. Yeah, that diabetes, you're never going to overcome that. Yeah, 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 that, that thing that your father died of, you're going to die of the same thing. You're going to die. I know somebody that died of a heart attack at a young age because he said, well, everybody, in, all the men in my family died before the age of 60. And this person died before they were 60 years old. Because the enemy, yeah, 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 that's coming, that's coming. Well, no, no. It says hold fast to your profession. Well, why do you, why do you suppose the writer of the book of Hebrews said hold fast to it? Because there's going to be some things, and it's called the accuser, that's going to come at you and try to get to you to change your confession. Yeah. He wants you to admit to a crime you didn't commit. He wants you to take responsibility for something that's not yours. And yeah, he's going to put pressure on it because he wants you to, to admit to it. He wants you to take it back on. He wants you to look back and see yourself the way you used to be. You used to be that way. All of us were that way. The Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. He wants us to look back to the way we used to be. Yeah, yeah unredeemed. <laughs> he wants us to look at our life before it was under the blood. He wants to try and convince us that's just the way you still are. You're still that way. You're still the sick trying to get healed. No, your confession needs to be I'm the healed keeping myself from getting sick. Yeah. I'm the rich, yes. not the poor. Come on. You say, well, I don't have very much. Yeah, you do. Your father owns the cattle on a thousand hills and yes. all the silver and gold, yes. and you're part of that family. Yes, yes. Growing up as a kid, I, I, whatever my dad had, I had. Right. I didn't go around, well, <laughs> my mom and dad are rich, but I'm poor. He just knew your mom and dad, whatever they, whatever they had of him, man, it's yours. <laughs> well, you've got a new father. You've got a new dad. Yes. Amen. Father, Regardless yeah. of how wealthy your other, your, your original father was, your natural father was, and he may be alive today, and he may be wealthy today, and he may not be, he may have left you a natural inheritance, but do you know the inheritance that your father left is that much more? Oh, Jesus. But the, but, but the enemy... Getting back to what I said, the enemy wants you to, to give a confession of something that's not yours. He wants you to confess to a crime that you didn't commit. He wants you to confess to a crime you didn't commit. See, that's why it's important, so important to plead the blood. Because the moment you plead the blood, you didn't commit the crime. It gets under the blood. You're no longer the one that committed the crime. Now, I'm not going to advocate that you just keep living the way you want to live and keep pleading the blood. There ought to be a place where we ought to grow up in the things of God where we stop, amen, or at least becomes less, more far and few between, amen. But thank God that the blood never dries up. Thank God that the blood is alive. Thank God that it's ever working right now on the mercy seat on our behalf. See, the Bible tells us there, it says, uh, verse 15 of Hebrews 14, it says, For we have not a high priest. See, this is the important thing we need to understand. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. I love how he covers, he backs up, he says, hold fast to your profession. Well, how do you hold fast to your profession? Verse 15 says, We have a high priest which was touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are. Jesus was tempted with, you've got to hold fast to your profession of Jesus because when you hold fast to your profession of Jesus, you understand there's nothing you're going through that Jesus didn't go through. Come on, that ought to be something that ought to be shouting words right there. To know that your Savior, to know that your Lord was tempted with what you're te being tempted with right now if you're, under, if you're underneath duress and underneath pressure. 
He went through it. If we keep that in our minds all the time, knowing that when the difficult time hits, we've got somebody, our high priest, the great high priest, the one that we are hold fast to our profession to, experienced it. He went through it. And he came out on the other side of it. And if he came out on the other side of it, you come out on the other side of it, glory to God. Because now you're in him and he's in you. Yes, high priest. He is the high priest of our confession or profession. But let's go on reading. It says, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of her, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us, say let us. Let us therefore come boldly. See, because, of we, because we know this and because we're holding fast to our confession of innocence, yes. come on, we're holding yes. fast to our confession. Yes. Don't let the enemy come along when you've got something going on in your life and get you to start thinking, well, I wonder what I did wrong. You did nothing wrong. Yeah, where did I miss it? Yeah, well, I wonder where I missed it. Does it really matter? It's under the blood. Right. Does it really matter where you missed it? It's under the blood. It's under the blood. Yeah. See, if you start trying to figure out where you miss it, now you're just giving the enemy more ammunition to go, yeah, yeah, see, you did miss it. See? See, even you're saying you missed it. Even you're, even you're looking for it. See, you, you know you missed it. You're starting to talk about it now. Well, I must have missed it here. No, you didn't miss it anywhere because Jesus fulfilled it. We're walking in him. And Jesus didn't miss it. And if we're walking in him, we didn't miss it. Come on, we got to understand this, church. This will get victory in our life. This will get healing in our bodies. This will give us increase in every arena of our life. We didn't miss it. She's looking at me saying, I got something, I got something. Come on, share it. Hurry up, I got to keep going here. I know you do. So I want to keep us in this court of law. Keep us in the mindset. This is legal business we're talking about. I told you last week, get out of your churchified thinking. When you hear these certain words, right away we go to the churchified thinking and like, I don't even know what that means. Great high priest, what does that mean? I, don't, I never had a high priest. I don't know what a high priest. Well, I'm going to tell you what a high priest is. Because Jesus is our great high priest. Great high priest. It means to preside over the supreme council when convened for judicial deliberations. Judicial deliberations. He is the great high priest pleading with us, standing for us in the council of the Supreme Court and holding fast to our confession. Who good profession. Catch. Holding fast to our confession, our profession. Remember, we've taught in this church before that word confession, profession, is homo logeo. Homo logeo. Homo means same. Logeo means speak. So homo logeo, your profession, your confession, you say the same thing that your great high priest says. Hallelujah. Amen. Yep. You say the same thing. Say the same thing. I'm going to bring something to that point, but for, yeah. right, I'm going to go on reading here. Verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Well, you can only come boldly to the throne, which is the meeting place, by the blood. Yeah. Right. right. Old Testament, Exodus 25, Pastor Dean already said that God said in Exodus 25 that the meeting place says, or I will meet with you at the place of where the blood is. So when we plead the blood now, spiritually speaking, we're saying we're meeting with you there, God. So that's where you're going. Boldly come to the throne. Come to the meeting place, yes. which is the place of blood. Yes. Come to where the blood is, yes. the mercy seat. Yes. Well, it goes on to say there, it says, Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Now, I want to read that out of the New Living Translation. I'm going to read that out of the New Living 
chapter 4, verse 16. And it may not even be the same as the new living that they put up on the screen up here because I, we realized last night the, the new living that I have, why it sounds different sometimes than the new living that's in our Bible program that we put up on the screen. It's because this was the original new living, that, the first one that was written after the Living Translation back in 1996. They came up with a new living, another new living translation. They revised it in 2000 or 2001, something like that. So there's some things that they changed again. So sometimes it doesn't. So I'm going to read it out of the 1996 version because it says here in verse 16, let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy. So that's the first thing we're thinking about doing. When we're coming, we're going to receive his mercy, which means you're going to receive his forgiveness. If there's something that happened, you're going there, you're getting it under the blood. You ever heard this phrase? We're going, you go and get it under the blood as quick as you can. That's why David was considered a man after God's yes. own heart, because he was a quick <laughs> repenter. He immediately got it under the blood. Yes. He got immediately to ask yes. for forgiveness. He didn't yes. get it under the blood because the blood then was the blood of bulls and calves. Yes. So in sense it was, but not like we are in New Testament where we're getting it under the blood of Jesus Christ. But you've got to get it under the blood. Don't him haw around, don't, don't no. skirt the issue, don't play the blame game, no. don't, well, I didn't really do it, somebody else, or if somebody wouldn't have done this, I would have never did it. No, don't, don't make excuses for your mess up. Right. Don't make excuses for your screw up. Just immediately say, you know what, Lord, I did it, I, I plead the blood, I'm getting it under the blood right now, cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Yeah. I'm just taking care of it. I'm not blaming anybody. There may have been other people involved, so on and so forth, but it has no bearing on me right now. I made a wrong choice. I made a wrong decision. And I'm getting it underneath the blood. So we're, go, we're doing that to receive. I'm, I'm ringing up here a little bit. Just back me down just a touch. It says, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy. So many times we do that as the church. We go there and receive his mercy. But then there's part two of verse 16. It says, and, 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 and we will find grace to help us when we need it. Well, we know that grace is his favor. Many times what we do is we, 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 get, the, for, we get the confession part of it down. See, this is the, the confession side of uh, confessing our faults or confessing our wrongs. We come to the, to the throne room and we're confessing our fault. We're, we're getting it underneath the blood. We're not making that confession to the enemy. We're confessing it to the one that took care of the issue because we need his forgiveness. We need him to, to take on what, 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 we, were, what we were doing. We, we need to see that we're underneath the blood. Amen? It says, and then you find grace. Well, many times what we do is we go to the confession part, but we don't hang around the throne long enough to find the grace, to get the favor. We need his favor. We need his favor. I'll never forget, I heard a preacher say one time, actually the preacher was Jerry Seville. I was reading one of his books and it just, it rungs true with me and I've used it numbers of times and have seen it work. But the favor of God, what we're, what we're really doing is you're going to the throne of God and, and when you get in there, you're going to obtain mercy to get you cleansed of what just took place. But then after you get yourself cleansed, you know, there may be some fallout. Y'all know what I'm talking about? There may be some fallout from the decisions that you made, the wrong decisions that you made. What you've got to do then is you, it says, and then you get the grace. Well, what does it mean? And they get, then you say, God, since grace is his favor, you say, God, I need a favor. I know I did wrong. I, I know I screwed up here. And I know you've cleansed me. I just received your mercy. I know I'm good with you. You, you and I are tight. We're good with one another. But God, you know what? There's a little aftermath. From my poor decision, I need a favor. Would you clean that up? Would you take care of that situation for me? Would you clean up that mess? So I, how many know I, I love being forgiven, but how many know I don't want the aftermath of my poor decisions? And if you stick around long enough and get the grace, get his fa ask him for a favor, because see, you can't, you, you can try to go clean it up and you may be able to clean it up. But how many know it's going to take you a whole lot longer to clean up and it may cost you a whole lot more to clean up than what you want? How many know that you can ask God the Father, say, Father, Dad, how many have ever had kids that come to you and say, I need a favor? I made a wrong, wrong decision. How many know that as a parent, 
to the best of your ability. You can clean that mess up probably a little bit quicker than they can because they're not where you at and they don't know the things that you know. Well, we need to humble ourselves enough to know we're not where God's at and we don't know what he knows. Amen. Can you all agree? Amen. You're not where God's at and you don't know what he knows. How many knows that the Holy Ghost is smarter than you are? Brother Mark Hankins said in the meetings that we were, I've heard him say it a number of times, but he said it again in the last meetings we were in at the Spiritual Awakening. He said his father told him, Holy Spirit will make you look like a genius. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But we need to ask a favor. Well, sometimes, you know, you can do that. I'm, I will get back to the point I was making about Jerry Seville and, the, and what I heard him share in a book that he had is uh, he said he had a friend that was going through some really difficult times and did not know the word like he knew the word. He says, and the Lord just prompted in his heart, he says, well, why don't you ask me for a favor? And Jerry Svell said, I just made me realize, how many have ever asked a favor on behalf of a friend? You go to somebody and just say, I need a favor. Well, I've done that before. The person doesn't know what to do, and I just went to him and says, Lord, I need a favor. Would you work on that person's behalf? A favor to me. I'm your son. I'm your daughter. You say I'm your daughter. I need a favor. Would you go do, do take care of something on my behalf just, just because I'm your son? Do me a favor. Hallelujah. We need to keep it simple. Hallelujah. We need to keep it simple. You got a lot to say today. I have a testimony about that. I was in an accident. It was my fault. And I did a very bad thing. I had put my grandson, who was five at the time, in his car seat, in the back seat, and he pitched a fit. He didn't want to be in the back seat. He wanted to ride in the front with Nani. So I caved, and I put him in the front seat. And I said, but you're going to have to be buckled in, and you're going to have to lay down. So I put him in the front seat. I buckled him in and I laid the seat all the way back. And I rear-ended somebody. And the balloons went off. And my grandson's life was spared because he was laying down. He started screaming, Nani, my eyes, my eyes, the dust got in his eyes. But long story short, he's fine, I was fine, everybody was fine, except the car wasn't fine. But I had to go to court because I had a child in the front seat in improper restraints. And it was punishable by jail. And so I was sweating. But I was praying, and the Lord reminded me of that verse, come boldly to the throne of grace. And so he told me, when you go before the judge, you ask for favor. So the judge called me up and said, how do you plead? Well, in that case, I was guilty. And I said, I plead, I plead guilty. And then the judge looked at me and said, what do you have to say? And I say, I ask for favor and mercy, please. And they find me. And that was it. But the Lord applied that principle in my life, that that's how it works. You ask God what to say, and he tells you to say what to say. He tells you when you're facing the situation, he tells you what to say. So he told me what to say to that judge. Yes, I had done it wrong. Yes, I was, I was at fault. I took responsibility. I pled guilty. But the Lord told me, you asked for favor and mercy, and I asked for it, and I got it. Amen. Hallelujah. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to look at just a couple more scriptures, and then we'll close. Hebrews chapter 10. For sake of time, I would encourage you to read the entire chapter because it talks about the Old Testament way of bringing sacrifices in through the blood of bulls and goats, so on and so forth. And when you get on down to verse 19, verse 19 of Hebrews chapter 10, I'm going to read this out of the King James. We're going to jump back to the King James. <laughs> Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Doesn't that go along with Hebrews chapter 4? Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Yes. See, when you know what the blood has done, you can come boldly into the presence of God. Yes. Amen. 
I said, when you know what the blood of Jesus has done and what it is doing, you can come boldly into the presence of God without Glory. guilt or condemnation. I said verse 20, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh. Yeah. And having a high priest over the house of God, verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Let us hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering. See, when we come in with our confession. We've got to come in without wavering. Yeah. I mean, you just come in and what you believe, you believe. And there's nothing that's going to cause you to sway from it. Does that mean the circumstance may change immediately? No, it may not change immediately. But the circumstance, the changing of the circumstance in the outward does not determine whether or not you hold fast or believe what you're saying. Now, Pastor Dina made mention of the word confession or profession, which is the word in the Greek is homilasio, which is a compound word, homo and logos. Homo is saying the same word. Logos means the word or the word of God. Well, you've got to understand something about that word. It goes a little bit deeper than just saying the same thing. It does mean that you say the same thing, but it's a little bit deeper than that because what it... What it's saying is, is you're saying the same thing because you have revelation. It doesn't mean that you just parrot something. Come on. Now understand this. Your confession or your profession may start out that way. You've got to start somewhere. You just start speaking the word of God and confessing the word of God. And, and uh, if you've ever done it like I have, when there's new truth coming, is you'll, you'll see it in the word and you'll start speaking it. But somewhere you're just like, yeah, I really don't know. But you don't stop saying it. You don't stop saying it. But it's not about what, what it's not just, uh, I guess the way I would say it, is it's not just a mere natural knowledge of the word or parroting what someone else has said. Which means that's why you hear me make some quotes, you'll hear her make some quotes. Things that Brother Hagen has said, you know, or Brother Copeland has said, or others have said. We do that, but, but I do that primarily when I do that is because those things have become mine. And actually, I heard one preacher say is after preaching it two or three times or four times and it becomes yours, you really don't have to make reference to where you got it from anywhere because now it's your truth. But I still make reference of those things sometimes. But what I'm saying is, when you, when you, have you ever talked with somebody and everything they share with you with regards to the word of God or the things of God is, well, brother so-and-so says this. Well, brother so-and-so says that. Well, sister so-and-so says this. Well, sister so-and-so says that. Well, I went to this meeting and brother so-and-so said this. And sometimes it gets me to the point that, yeah, but what do you say? I love what they said. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with what they said. But what do you say? Because when you can speak it yourself, because it's become a revelation of yours, that's when it's actually going to start producing in your life. Thank you, Lord. Yes. 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 See, if you're not seeing things produce in your life, maybe it's not yours yet. Nothing wrong with if it's not yours yet. But believe God and trust God and trust the Holy Spirit for that revelation. Pray, God, that the revelation, the eyes of your understanding, Ephesians chapter 1, would be open, that you would know the hope of your calling, that revelation and wisdom would come. You need the revelation of God's word. It needs to become yours. It needs to become a part of you, not just something you say. It needs to become a part of you. I just had her post something on our Facebook page saying, the church is not something that you do. The church is who you are. See, we think churches, so many in the body of Christ think church is something that you do. That's why it's so easy to not do it. Because, well, it's just something I do. Well, I just go to church on Sunday morning. No, church is who you are. That's scriptural. Jesus said, you are the church. Paul, with the revelation, said, you are the church. No, church is who you are. See, and when that revelation comes, it's who you are. It makes it a lot easier than to come to fellowship with the rest of the church. It makes it easier to come and serve the church. Yeah. It's who you are. 
when you know that's who you are. Live and breathe the word. You got to be part of the body. Yes. 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 Amen. Yes. And be connected to the body. Hallelujah. To be a supply and joint of the body. Glory. You are the body. Glory. Amen. Amen. But the Bible there again, it says, verse 23, it says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Well, like I said, you've got to read this whole chapter in its context and not just chapter 10. You've really got to, to get it in its full context, you've got to read chapter 11 and chapter 12. Right, right. Because chapter 10 begins to end it here with holding fast the profession of your faith. Well, what are you holding fast to? Well, chapter 11 is the hall of fame of faith. Right. It shows us many of examples of those that held fast to their profession of faith. Right. What was the profession that they held to? The promise of the Messiah. Everything that they did in the Old Testament, what they hold fast to? They held fast to the fact that the Messiah was coming. Right. The Messiah's coming. Right. The Messiah's coming. Right. The Messiah's coming. The Messiah's coming. Ooh. The Messiah's coming. Lord. Well, we've got a little bit better profession because now we've got the Messiah came. Yeah. The Messiah came. But our profession now is he's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back. But until he comes back, we've got some things to do. We've got to live in the fullness that he provided Lord, for us. You, we hold fast the profession that he's Lord. Thank you, Lord. I said we hold fast the profession that he's Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. Well, what does that mean, holding fast the profession that he's Lord? He is Lord. That he is Lord over everything. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Take your finger and go, that means me. Yes. That means me. See, that's where yeah. we struggle many times is he's not Lord over me. Yeah, I know he's Lord over the enemy. I know he defeated the enemy. I know that he's Lord over this, and I know that he's Lord. I know he's Lord over all the earth. Well, are you in the earth? Yeah. Then guess who he's Lord over? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then who calls the shots? He does. Once again, I'll go back to what I shared last week, and I share, I, I, you hear me say it all the time, and I'll never stop sharing it. When the Bible, when the Lord says... I'm going to not even use the word Bible because this is what the Lord says. How I many know the Bible is what the Lord says? When the Lord says lift holy hands, what we ought to be doing? Lifting holy hands. When the Lord says let your mouth be continually filled with praise, what ought your mouth be filled with? Praise. When the Lord says don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, what ought you be doing on Sunday morning and Wednesday nights and any other time the church doors are open? Coming together. You may say, well, that's just legalism. No, it's not. It's the Word of God. Now, if you want to call the Word legalism, well, it is a legal document. We know that. Yeah. We still need Jesus. I'm not saying this to judge you or to, or to bring condemnation to you. I'm trying to say that if you want to walk in more of what God has for you yes. and walk in the fullness yes. and walk in the victory, yes. then we've got to confess His Lordship. And when we confess His Lordship, that means we do what the Lord says. Glory. Amen. Amen. And it will go well with you. Hallelujah. Hold fast to your confession of faith. Yes. Your confession of faith is started in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Turn over there quick. You, We're talking about confession. You, Turn to Romans chapter 10. Your whole walk with God, your whole entrance into the family of God, your whole entrance into the redemptive process that Jesus did started with this one thing. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says that if you confess with your mouth, say what? If you do what? Confess with your mouth. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. With the mouth, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Well, do you know that that doesn't stop the minute you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior yeah. and believe in your heart? Yeah. That confession, or because so, the word salvation there is sozo means wholeness, complete, in every arena. 
So which means if you're not complete in your body, if you're not complete and whole in your finances, if you're not complete or whole right now in, your, in relationships or in any arena of your life, if you're not complete and whole in any arena of your life, what does it say to do here? It says, with the mouth, confession is made unto wholeness. Well, what does that mean? You ought to be speaking some things. Yeah. You ought to be saying what yeah. the word says. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. You ought to be confessing. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, 11, we shared this last week, we'll share it again. Revelation chapter 12, 11 says that they overcame him. See, many times we'll quote that. My, my wife brought it to my attention yesterday because we can kind of, one word can make a difference in how you look at the scripture. It's, but many times you'll hear people just to throw that scripture out and go, yeah, we overcome by the, word of the, by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. But it says we overcome him. We overcome him. Well, the Bible tells us that we are more than overcomers. So how do you overcome the enemy? By the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. Well, that word testimony is also the same word as confession or profession. What are you professing and confessing? Many times we think that if we just testify of all the good things that God has done, and there is nothing wrong with that, that helps you in walking in the fullness going forward, thinking about all the things. But the, your testimony... What is your testimony? Well, that's another legal term. You're called to testify. Well, what are you testifying of? You ought to be able to testify of what the Word says. Yeah. You also ought to be able to testify of what God has done in your life. But when the rubber meets the road, you ought to be able to testify just what the Word says. Glory. Well, what does that mean, testify what the Word says? Well, the Word says that we're new creations in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Yeah, I testify. I'm testifying, witnessing, confessing that I'm a new creature. Old things have passed away. Everything's been made brand new. I'm testifying that I'm cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. I'm testifying that my old life has passed away and there's a brand new life that, was, that I'm, I'm lived, living in right now. I've been raised up in. I've been raised with Christ. My body's been crucified with Christ and I've been raised up with Him. That's a testimony. Amen. Sometimes testifying what the Word says about you, not just about everything that God has done for you, and that's just as important, but that's just one part of praise, or that's just one part of testimony. And we ought to be doing that because it encourages one another. That is a part of confession. Don't keep wincing, it ain't going to change. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. We're talking about confession. Talking about confession. You've got to speak. Something's got to come out of your mouth. You can't sit silent. A silent Christian is a defeated Christian. The example the Lord keeps giving me over and over and over and over again. In, in the definition of mercy seat and high priest, it's about judicial and the court of law. And one of the definitions is about conducting a marriage. And I keep seeing it over and over and over, confessing. If when he and I stood before God and the witnesses, and we had to make a declaration to each other, do you take this man, do you take this woman? I had to respond to that when they asked me. When they asked me, do you take this man, I had to respond to it. If I had not responded, we would not be married. And that's the same terminology, exact same terminology as confessing Jesus Christ's lordship. We must use our mouth to declare and interact in the covenant. Because the word homologeo, as Pastor pointed out, it is a covenant term. You speak and you are immediately put into covenant with him. That's how it happens. It doesn't happen any other way. You must speak it out. You believe it in your heart. You speak it out your mouth. And now you partake of the covenant. And everything that belongs to him now belongs to you. 
Amen. I'm just going to give you an Old Testament example here, just quickly. Lord gave this to me. Numbers chapter 13. This is the story of the 12 spies. <clears throat> In Numbers chapter 13, It says in verse 18, it says, in Moses, actually verse 17, Moses sent them to scout out the land of Canaan and said to them, get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land, what is, and the people that dwelleth therein, where they be strong or weak, few or many. And I want to say this with that portion there. There's nothing wrong with going to the doctor, there's nothing wrong with getting some information about what's going on. Because Moses told them, you know, go in and check out the land. Go in and find out what you're facing. See, faith, uh, primarily, I just felt like the need to say this as the Lord gave this to me back a couple days ago. With regards to our bodies, faith doesn't mean that you ignore it or you don't go to the doctor and pretend like it doesn't exist. Sometimes you've got to go just to find out what you're facing so you know how to stand. You know how to go, you know how to attack it with the word of God and you know how to attack it with the name of Jesus. Sometimes you just got to know them things. You can't attack something if you don't know what it is that you're up against. So sometimes just go and find out what you're facing is a good thing. Moses told the 12 spies that. But then it says that they came back, you go on reading there, and they came back, and I'm just for the sake of time, we know that the 10 didn't have a very good report. And you jump on down to verse 30. It says, And Caleb stilled the people because uh, some, things, some grumbling was going on before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome. Well, what, do we, what does that mean with regards to confession? Well, Caleb and Joshua were hanging on to what God had told them earlier, that he was giving them a land that flowed with milk and honey. And that's all they were thinking about. So that even though they went in and they saw some things, the things that they saw was not the determination of what they confessed or how they acted. They stayed with what God said. They weren't denying the fact that there were giants in the land. They weren't denying that there was adversaries in the land. They weren't denying that there were some obstacles in the land. They just didn't bring attention to those things. They stuck with what God said and they said the same thing that God said. We're well able. We're going in. We're well able. So this is, this is important. This is key. It says, but if the men, but the men that went up with him said, but be, we be not able to go against the people for they are stronger than we. So you know the people are grumbling and complaining there. Now you jump over to number 14. This is why it's important to speak what God speaks. Numbers 14 verse 27 says, God is talking now to Moses. How long shall I bear with this evil congregation with murmur against me? See, when you're saying something contrary to the word of God, you're murmuring against God. This is what the children of Israel did. And God, God got a little, a little irritated with it. Let's just be honest here. God's got a little irritated. He says, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children. God hears the words that come out of our mouth. He hears our testimony. He hears our confessions. He says, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which murmur against me. Say unto them, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as you have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. Well, a better way to translate that way. So you have spoken into my ears. This is what's going to happen to you. God basically said, you're going to get what you said. God did not bring calamity upon them. They brought calamity upon themselves by the words that they spoke. Well, you want to speak sickness and disease in your life, guess what you're going to have? Because your words are spirit. You've got to understand, your words are spirit. You can call things into being, or you can curse things and get them removed out of your life. But if you're declaring over yourself, well, I'm sick. Guess what you're going to be? Sick. Well, if you're declaring over yourself, well, I'm poor. I don't have enough. Guess what? You're not going to have enough. If you're saying, well, my marriage is a... Guess what you're going to have? A marriage that's not very good. 
If you're saying, well, my job is this, or my job is that, or my boss is this, or my boss is that, and a negative condescension, guess what? Do you think your job's going to get any better each day when you go back to it? But you've got to speak what God says about it. You've got to speak life. If you believe, I, I use this phrase, if you believe that your job is a, is a resource that God is using to bless you, then why do you want to curse it with your words? Come on. It goes with any area of your life. If you believe that God has given you this body to live a full life on this earth and fulfill his plan, then why do you want to curse it with your words? Well, I'm just sick. You can bless with your words or you can curse with your words. It's all up to you. See, and God doesn't supersede because he's given us that authority to speak with our mouth. So he doesn't supersede your words. Don't think that getting saved is it was the end. It's just confessing Jesus as Lord. No, now the real fun begins. And I say that truthfully. I don't say that facetiously or sarcastically because there's challenges to being a Christian, obviously, and there's challenges to walking out the, the blessings and the promises of God and challenges to walking out your purpose and your plan. There are challenges to it. But I can tell you one thing right now, 28 years of serving God and going strong, those challenges have been fun, exciting, challenging, and to see what God will do next and how he has brought us through situations, it is absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So hold fast. Hold fast. Which means there's going to take some effort. I said there's going to take some effort. Because the accuser is going to come to try to get you and coerce you into a confession that is not yours. Don't you give in. I said don't you give in. Hallelujah. Don't you give in. Regardless of what it looks like, don't you give in. The minute you give in and start speaking with a problem, you begin to take ownership of it. And the minute you take ownership of it, it will begin to manifest. You take ownership of the promises of God and those will begin to manifest. Amen. Take ownership of the word of God. Take ownership of what God says about you. Take ownership of, of, of the word of God and those things will begin to manifest in your life. Don't you take ownership of something that Jesus took. Jesus took the penalty. You don't take that ownership back with your words. You leave it where it's supposed to be. It was on the cross and it went to hell. Leave it there. Do not resurrect it with your words. Your words will, bring, will resurrect some things. But your words will also keep some things in the grave. Keep them in the grave. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God.